Well, good morning, everybody. And I guess I'm a little slow because first service, I just I realized that we saw we just finished singing a song about be still, and then you look at the title up there, it was shaken up. All right, so hey, you know, and uh, some of you guys might be singing in your mind right now, um, something, right? And if you weren't, you are, right? But uh, but good morning. I'm glad you guys are here today. Um, thank you so much for being here in our home. Thank you, family, for being here. Um, there might be some stragglers coming in here, but again, we live, we live in an era where we don't have to go around and move our clocks back anymore or forward, right? We have technology that does that for us, or it's supposed to, and, uh, and that's nice. That makes it nice, but, uh, but also if you're visiting here today, thank you for being here and coming to our, this house of worship, our church, body just a wonderful time to be able to spend together, to lift up the Lord, to extol Him, as was our theme to our Acts 1-8 conference. And I encourage you guys to get into Psalm 145 and dive into that because, oh man, there's some beautiful things in there that talks about what we ought to be doing, how we ought to be lifting up our Lord. But at the same time, when we do something and we share the truth of God and we just extol Him, it's going to be passed down from one generation to another. And so... I encourage you on that. And so I know that Mike had already shared that of the uh, up and coming women's conference, you guys have the QR code there. And then also with the, the uh, dinner theater that we have for two nights. So he shared all of that. Please go sign up, be a part of that. It's, both of them are going to be wonderful. Um, awesome opportunity to fellowship, food, edify, just all that put together, right? But most importantly, God will be glorified. And then please continue to pray for the Argentina team. And uh, they are still, they got held up, I think, in Chile, um, but they are on their way back. They should be landing within the next hour or so. So please pray for their safe travels, their safe landing. Um, I have no doubt that what they did down there is eternal. Um, and I saw one video on Facebook, and there might be more out there. But, but again, I think it's funny. Americans taking football or soccer to Argentina, right? Yeah. So, uh, and they got a guy named Messi, you know, and a, a cup win. So, but anyway, it's still, it's a platform to be able to share Jesus, to be able to talk about Jesus. Plus also they did baseball, which was really cool. That would be a draw. And then just the gringos being there, that's, that's a big deal. So please, uh, but God's a bigger deal. Right? We're just a platform. So please be praying for them as they get here. Ask questions when they are here. And then also please be praying for Cody Millie Walker and his family. Now it's time for follow-up. It's time for them to to keep continuing to move forward, to kind of do some follow-up with people who maybe had made some professions of faith. Um, and, uh, but then also, I believe that next week they have another team that, from their church that's going to be visiting. So um, just pray for their strength, endurance, and pray your hand would be upon them. So it's just wonderful being a part of a church that's part of missions. If you haven't been on a mission trip, this is a plug. Pray about it. Maybe God will, will send you out there one day. It'll change your life, right? And so um, today, as you see, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. So please turn, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And while, well, you might already be there, but, or put your device or however you use to get to the Word of God. But before we get started, we just need to know a little bit about the book of Hebrews. Uh, you got to know that this book is not written to Gentiles, okay? Because it's written to Hebrews, right? It's written to Hebrews. I'm not a Hebrew. You're not a Hebrew, right? But at the same time, when you go through and study out this book, you understand that the writer, which we believe to be Paul, um, there's much that, evidence that points there, but that the writer is speaking to an audience that may know Christ, they may not know Christ, or they think they know Christ, but they really don't. And so you see that verbiage that he uses, and we'll see it today in our reading, that he's trying to bring these men and women unto a place to understand of this new covenant. So it's written to the scattered Jews to reveal the establishment of the new covenant by Jesus Christ. That's who the writer's writing to. He wants to help these Jews to understand of this new covenant. And, and, and just one piece that very well might be Paul is that Paul was very well versed in the Old Testament covenant, but he was also very well versed in the New Testament covenant. He was able to marry those together to be able to get us this writing that's in front of us. So 
So as, as this, God is using this now, but yet he's going to use it in the tribulation. And at the same time, he's using it now for us. But now, there's a lot of truths and a lot of principles that we as a Gentile church, if you would, can apply. And that's what we're going to look at today. And so the book of uh, Hebrews or chapter 11 and chapter 12, really a lot of it points us to a way of faith. It talks about those who believe by faith and and we see that faith, it gets woven through this chapter, through the life of Christ on into eternity, okay? And so, um, but yet at the same time, chapter 12 talks about chastisement or God's discipline. We see more of it at the beginning of the chapter, but it is woven through the rest of the chapter. So for example, the first few verses talks about Jesus Christ, how he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he, he sat down at the right hand of God. Okay, and so with that, we understand that he was chastised, but not for his own sin, obviously, but for our sin. So God placed his wrath upon Christ for mankind's sin. But as we continue to go, you see this piece of chastisement being taken place. Look at verses 11. I'll actually start in verse 10, and I'm going to read here, 10 and 11. It says, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit. So the writer here is talking about the difference between the chastisement or discipline from our earthly fathers compared to our heavenly fathers. And he says, for their own pleasure. So let me restart all over. For they verily for a few days chasten us for their own pleasure, but he for our profit, so it's for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now remember that word because we're going to talk about it a lot today. Now, no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So the two words that really pop out there are holiness and righteousness. That's what God's chastisement is there for, okay? It's there to lead us to a place of holiness and righteousness. He designed it to lead us to him. That's what his chastisement's for. So when you look at what that's going to produce, now just take that word holiness and righteousness. We know that is the person of Jesus Christ. That's what he embodies. That's who he is. And so in order for us to be like him, we can also use the word godliness. I believe it's uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 that actually gives you a definition of what godliness is. God, godliness is because it defines the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that embodies what godliness is. And so that's how we ought to live. So Christ's likeness is godliness, it's holiness, and it's righteousness. And the only way that we can draw near to God is through holiness and righteousness. Now that might sound familiar because I, I, I took that from Kevin Petsky. He said that at our Acts 1-8 conference of extolling the Lord, but it fit perfect with what we're going through today. So again, the only way that we can draw near to God through holiness is through holiness and righteousness, okay? But what we're going to see is that this is directly connected to the fear of the Lord. That's what we're going to see in the passage today. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, should be up on the screen. You can, you can also go to your Bible and read it. It says, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God, remember that, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So there's godliness there, there's godly fear, there's reverence, there's serving, all in one verse. And that's huge for us to learn and to understand. Because the one thing that I think is really missing through the church as a whole today is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is something that keeps us on the straight and narrow. And I believe that right now, a lot, if, a, if a believer gets caught up in sin, you know, um, in this same chapter, chapter 12, chapter one, or verse 1 talks about that sin that doth easily beset us. The one that we think we've conquered. The one that we think that we've turned over to the Lord. But it always creeps its way back in, right? And when we walk and we choose to step into that sin that doth easily beset us, I promise you in that moment when you make that decision, you're not fearing the Lord. And so in Exodus chapter 20, verse 
20. We're going to read it now. We'll come back to it here in a little bit. But as I was studying, I thought it was interesting the words that the Holy Spirit saw fit to put in the Scripture. It says here, Exodus 20, 20, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. There's a lot in this verse. In this verse. But what we see is that he f- said, fear not. So they had the wrong fear, but he said, take his fear. God wants to give you his fear. So when you talk about fear of the Lord, it's not something that's out there that we can understand and do ourselves. It's actually something that he gives us. He gives us his fear. He gives us the reverence that he has for himself. He gives us the awe that he has. That becomes part of us. And why? So that he can prove us. He's going to prove our hearts, what decisions we're going to make, and who we truly serve. But it leads us to a place, like it says here, that ye sin not. See, that's what the fear of the Lord is. And you go back and you look at verse 28, and he says, with reverence and that godly fear, the fear of the Lord, that which God gives you. Okay, And so when you have this proper fear, you'll serve God and not man. You'll live a life of selflessness and not selfishness because your eyes are focused on something bigger than we are. You know, one thing we'll talk about a little bit is that there's another theme that goes through this book, and it's, it's, it's the theme of better and greatness. This Bible lays out seven different things that are greater than Something, things that we get to look forward to greater than what we already know. And what we know that is better, one of the main themes is that Jesus' blood is better. His sacrifice is better. It's a new, better testament. You see this woven throughout the entire book. And so that's what the fear of the Lord is going to capture our hearts and our lives and help us to stay on the straight and narrow, okay? And so when you look at verse 28, I kind of broke this down a little bit. It says, serve God, right? Right? And I looked that up, and it means to minister and to worship him. That's just one aspect, but that's what it means. It says acceptably. That that means a manner that is well-pleasing. And it says godly fear. And yes, reverence. We know godly fear is reverence. They're very similar. But it also means taking well. It means circumspectly. And it means being devout. So if you take this verse and put it into a sentence, and I'm not elevating this sentence above the Scripture, But this is what it kind of defines out for us. This verse defines out for us that all of this together means to minister and worship in a manner that is well-pleasing through a circumspect path of devotion. Okay? I'm going to read that again. To minister and worship in a manner that is well-pleasing through a circumspect path of devotion. And so as you're serving God, God is accepting that and you're going down the right path, and you're walking circumspectly, because why? God is going to prove you. He's going to challenge you that you sin not, and you're going to make those decisions, and the reason why you're going to make those decisions is because you have a heart devoted, fully devoted unto the Lord. You know what this is when you put this in a package? This is godliness, Christ-likeness, okay? It's the path of Jesus Christ, and this is the path that we have been called to walk and to be a part of. And so when you look, if we're supposed to be exactly like him, we're supposed to match Jesus step for step. We're supposed to match him and be like him. We're supposed to match Jesus or, and, and our Lord God in thought, in speech, in behavior. And if you're matching the Lord in thought, in speech, and behavior, you're going to be walking circumspectly. Your heart is going to be right. You're going to be on the right path And he's going to prove you, and guess what? You will not find yourself wanting. That challenge of when we do step out of line with God, we find ourselves in a place of shame and brokenness and sadness. But God has given us the formula that we need in order to have a right walk with him. It's right here, and it's throughout the rest of Scripture. You can find it in so many different places, right? And so godliness, this is one thing that godliness does. It prepares us for something greater and better than what we are currently currently experiencing right now. So that's what godliness is going to do. It's going to prepare you. You're walking like Christ, and every day should be greater. Every day should be better, and that's just temporal. 
One of these days, like what we're going to talk about, it's going to be something that's eternal, and we get to step into that greatness. And that's what I kind of want you to see through this message, is that we get to experience something greater, and we get to experience something better. We know some things are coming, and we have some responsibilities that this passage is showing us today. And so walk with me. Um, our first point of study is matching his life of godliness because we know what's coming. Before we get into this, um, I want to pray, and then we'll see and, and dissect this and break it down. Father, Lord, um, we humbly come before you, and uh, you're an amazing God. And uh, what you did for us um, is amazing. I'm so thankful for the blood of Jesus. I'm so thankful for the church, the body of Christ that you have chosen to use as a vehicle to spread the name of Jesus and to make a difference in the life of others. And we can live an abundant life. We don't just have to have salvation. We can live an abundant life. And I thank you for that. And thank you for the, this book of Hebrews, the writer that, um, as we don't know exactly who it is, Lord, we know that he had a passion and had a heart for the Jewish people. And Lord, through this, I ask and pray that you would continue to use it in the lives of everyone who read it. And this morning, as we meet with you, you would challenge us to walk in your ways, to match your walk, to live a godly life, to fear you, because, Lord, there's a greatness out there that we get to experience now and for eternity. Somebody here doesn't know Jesus as their Savior. Father God, please move them. That's where they, they, they need to step through that door with you and meet some greatness in their life, Lord. So meet with us now, prepare our hearts, and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what does it look like through our passage today? And so, again, the first point of study is matching his life of godliness because we know what is coming. And knowing what is coming should always, when we know what is coming, it should always motivate us to live for him because we're going to be with him. We get to be with God for all of eternity. Knowing that is coming, we get to be with him, okay? That should motivate us to live a life of devotion for him. So the Bible comes to an end. I've said that before. It actually does. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you're an eternal being right now. You're not waiting to get, become eternal. You are eternal right now. You just, you just haven't shed this temporal body. But the moment you do, if you know Jesus, you step into eternity with God, you get to experience what you already have. But the Bible itself, it does come to an end. And we know how the Bible ends. It ends in victory. But yet we don't have the details of eternity, and that's okay, right? That's okay. And so, but the Bible does share with us some things that we get to get into. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 9 through 10, this is a verse that many of us use to talk about things like this. Now, when you contextually go and study out this passage, this passage is not directing us specifically to heaven, Okay. If you look at it contextually, it's actually talking about God's wisdom, and it's his wisdom that has been revealed to us, which is the deep things of God. But yet at the same time, indirectly, we can say it connects because his wisdom takes us through scripture, which opens up to us the deep things of God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 9 through 10 says, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. We haven't seen it, right? But wait, look at the next verse. But God hath revealed them to us by his spirit, the spirit, his spirit of the Holy Ghost. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So we have a, a, a reality here that there are some things that the spirit of God is going to reveal to us as we study and as we grow and when we get into eternity. But there are some things that are specifically right here in Scripture. And so here I have it before you, look over at, um, and some of these things that we get to look forward to, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, or actually, I'm sorry, um, yeah, verse 22, well, yeah, it's 22. Now, we're not going to read all the, the verses here, but I put up there a list of what we get to look forward to. He says, but ye are come to Sion, I didn't even put that on the list. But he says, and he's talking to a certain people, remember that, that he's telling them what they have come to through Jesus Christ. And he says, we have come um, to Sion. But then he puts on here the city of the living God. 
You know, in Revelation 21, 2, that's called the holy city. He says the heavenly Jerusalem. In Revelation 21, 2, that's called the new Jerusalem prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. To an innumerable company of angels. In Re Revelation 5, 12, it says about the angels, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. That's a lot of angels. And this is what we get to come to, Right? And then uh, it says the general assembly in the church of the firstborn. The next slide there says the God, God, the judge of all. He judges the quick and the dead, Acts 10, 42. It also says the spirits of the men made perfect. Now this could be speaking of, it, it merits further study. All these merit further study. Be speaking about those Old Testament sta saints that heard the Lord when he spoke and, God, and Christ led cap captivity captive, okay? Could be talking about that. But here it, we're going to be looking at um, these next two. And, and it says to Jesus, the mediator, 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there was one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. But it also says the blood. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that changed everything. And this passage says that his blood is better than that of Abel's. Why? Because it's his blood that cleanseth us from all our sin. Now, this is one we can quickly go back to. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Because this passage tells us how beautiful and pure the blood of Jesus Christ is. It had redemptive power. In verse 12, it says, Neither by blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of the bulls and goats and of the ashes and of the heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to purify of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, disturbing the living God? So there's so much even here because this is talking about the redemptive power of the blood of Christ. But if that blood back there just had a little bit of cleansing power for a short period of time, but Jesus Christ's blood cleanses us for all of eternity, then it talks about that, that it should, our, our consciousness should be purged and that we should work to serve the living God. There we're back to service. So think about this. The writer is telling the listeners, this is what you get to come to. You get to come to this, a whole list. And you know what this is speaking of? This is speaking of the kingdom, the eternal kingdom that is spoken of that we're going to see in verse 28. But this whole, whole piece, all these pieces encompass the kingdom. This is something that we all get to be a part of, okay? And this is the future that we get to experience. And knowing this, when you know this is coming, as we saw in this uh, Hebrews chapter 9, when we know this is coming, this should produce in us a godly service. Well, why else, who else do we want to serve? Why else would we want to serve anything else? Now, I know we're all guilty of it, but we don't have to. We're not bound by that. Just as Christ served the Father, we too should also serve the Father. See, we have to match him. We have to match his walk. Holiness and righteousness is the way that we come to the Father, okay? And we're going to experience some wonderful things. Now, this passage here is really directed, we're going to see about the second coming. But everything that we're talking about here, we already have as the church. Remember, he's trying to get others to receive it and to understand it. But the next piece on our prophetical calendar is the rapture. That's what we as the church, we get to experience, right? But if we're not walking with Christ, as Christ, something's going to happen at that moment at the rapture, and we don't want to find ourselves wanting. When that day comes, we don't want to find ourselves ashamed. So 1 John 2.28 says, And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. See, that's what we get to look forward to as a church. There is a place for us in the second coming, but as a church, we don't want to be found, our, be found being ashamed. And I believe that with Jesus being our example, he knew he would one day see the Father, right? Did he not? He knew that he would. 
We one day will be with the Father. And I believe it was his motivation of this that led him to a place of purity. Because when you look at um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, look what it says about Jesus. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says, for the joy that was set before him. And I believe that a piece of that joy was he knew he was going to be reunited with the Father, but he also knew if he made one mistake, that re um, reunion would never happen. So that life of purity, that drive, that motivation to be with him, that's what led him to be impure without making a mistake, without making a decision to sin. So with that match, we ought to walk the same way. We one day will be the Father, with the Father. Should we not have the same desire? That should be our motivation, the same for us. And so when we look at our point of application here, we should match his walk now because we will be walking his way in the kingdom. See, if one day we're going to be walking as him, perfect and righteous and holy, without this, this tabernacle of flesh that is sinful, we're going to be walking with him in that holiness. We need to start it now. We need to live it out now. We need to do it now, because we're going to be 100% made like him, conformed to his image. But the only thing that's going to keep us here is that godly fear. The godly fear is what's going to keep you on that same path to be like Jesus. But also knowing what's coming, it should always motivate us to tell others about him because they won't be with him. See, we know we get to be with him. But we should be motivated to tell others because they won't. That's what this writer's doing. He's telling these, these people that if they don't accept the new covenant, they will not be with the Lord forever. Well, shouldn't our message also match his message? Shouldn't our desire also match his? Because people aren't going to be with him. Our message should be the same as him. So here's the thing. We have to take a look at and understand that the God is the one who decides on how he moves and how he approaches. We don't get to make things up, right? So God approached the Old Testament differently than he approaches us today. His desire is to be with his creation, and he's gone through great lengths to make sure that that happens, and he's entrusted us the gospel to be a part of that. And so he's telling the readers of this epistle that they don't approach God now as they did in the Old Testament. Look over here. At verse 17, it says, For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, or I'm sorry, jump down to 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto the blackness and darkness of the tempest. And the sound of the trumpet, and the voice of the words, and the voice of the heard entreated, that the word should be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so, much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. He says, you are not come as they came in the Old Testament. It is here in this passage, you go back to chapter 19 and 20 of Exodus, where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And he meets them by way of thunder and by lightning and darkness and burning. And they were fearful of that. You know, if that happened to us today, if God kept that same path and pattern to meet us, we would be fearful too if we saw something so extraordinary as that. But his way produced a fear in the lives of people. But it wasn't the right fear. It wasn't his fear. And he used Moses, Moses, his mouthpiece, to help everybody say, you don't have to be fearful of him. Just accept his fear. Again, go back to Exodus 20.20. 20. It's up on the screen. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. So fear of the Lord is not something that you can produce. This true fear can only be given by the Lord. The fear of the Lord is his fear, and it's given to prove you. And his fear is designed to keep you from sin and produce a life of godliness, to produce a life of reverence and a sense of awe. See, he was doing the same thing back then. He wanted the same outcome, but his approach was differently. But he tells the readers exactly how we come. He says, but the way is come 
is found, or but ye are come in verse 22. He says, but ye are come to Mount Sinai. And we went through that whole list. But as believers in understanding this new covenant through Christ, we understand the focal point of this is found, I believe, in verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. That is the focal point. See, we cannot enter into this rest, enter into eternity without Jesus Christ. He's telling the readers that God designed a way. And Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That is the way that God has chosen to approach us today. And the writer is wanting the reader to understand this. See, the problem is, is that even though God revealed himself to the nation of Israel, there were still some that refused the message. And he's telling us right here that we should not refuse this message, the message that we have. Look at verse 25. He says, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape, or shall not we escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shall I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Verse 27, And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain it. And so he's saying, refuse not the message that is come unto you. But then he gives us an illustration. And he says, back then I shook the earth. Okay, now put this together. I shook the earth and there were some refused. And in Haggai 2.6, he gives, that's where this promise comes from, that he's going to shake the earth again. But not only the earth, he's going to shake the heaven. And what we know this as is called the second coming of Jesus Christ. And what we learn right here is that if people refuse the message, they're going to be on the back end of God's wrath. They're not going to be able to experience the beautiful and wonderful things that we just saw in this list. And so the second coming is what, how he's going to shake up this earth. He's going to shake the earth. He's going to shake the heavens. And we know the rapture is coming for the church. After that, the tribulation. Then the second coming. Then the millennium. Then eternity all of that encompasses, God's going to shake it up. He's going to shake up everything that we know. And the illustration that I thought of was kind of just a simple one, like, like with wheat. And I don't know if they still do it today, but they have a, a basket. You put some wheat in, and you shake it around, and all the wheat falls to the bottom of the basket, but all the chaff flies away, okay? That which is discarded, that is not profitable, is discarded. You know what? Every soul that refuses this message was important and has value. But they discarded the message, and because of that, they will be discarded for all of eternity. But that doesn't change the fact that God loves them, but his justice and his judgment stands true, okay? And so our, our point of application here is we should match his message now because it's the only message that will stand the test of time, and it should also stay eternity. So that same message, we need to match it. We need to go out and tell people that there is a way, the truth, and the life, and his name is Jesus, because if not, they're going to be like that cha chafe or that chaff that's just going to be blown away in the wind, okay? So they must not refuse the voice. They have a choice, but they don't have to. But what's going to keep us in this, in this match of being like Christ is godly fear. That's what's going to keep us here, okay? And so with our second point here that we're going to be looking at, so what we just saw was matching his life of godliness because we know what's coming, but matching his life of godliness because we know where we stand. See, the scripture shows us right here where we stand. Look at verses 28. It says, wherefore we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Do you guys understand the importance of what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us? We live in a world where we, things are moving constantly. But that which God has deemed to be eternal, that's going to stand the test of time in all of eternity. We're on a foundation of stability that will last for eternity. No matter what our enemies say, we are going to be part of, when I say we, I'm talking about the church, uh, uh, we're going to be a part of this unmovable kingdom. Remember, the theme of the Bible is a king in a kingdom. 
And a king is going to be holy, so his kingdom is holy. And the only way we can approach him is through holiness and righteousness. That's the only way that we can approach him. That's the only way we can be a part of that. So when he gets up and he shifts that and he shakes it, right, the only thing that's going to land is that and stay in stability is that which is holy and righteousness. Okay? So if our kingdom is unmovable, then we should now be unmovable. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 through 58 says this, But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've already discussed his blood. We, we dis discussed his sacrifice. We have victory in Jesus, right? But because of this, therefore, because of that, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. There you go, that service again. For as much as we know, our labor is not in vain in the Lord. In the Lord. That's that, that godly fear, that's that service that we should have that is acceptable unto him. You understand? I hope you're getting this. Because here's the thing. You are on stable ground with God for all of, all of eternity. But we can forfeit that stable ground right now. Positionally, you're covered by Jesus Christ. And, and you will be with him forever. You can't lose that. But practically, if you forfeit right now the messages that we have received to go out after what God has called us to do, to be holy, to be righteous, if we forfeit that, then we will be unstable. And anything that happens in our life that shakes us up, we will be finding again ourselves wanting. So the only thing that can cause us to forfeit is that which that does not match the holiness of Jesus Christ. Again, that godliness. There are people out there, there are entities out there, our adversary, right, that is trying to shake us up a little bit, right? And you know what? Oftentimes, the adversary doesn't have to do a thing. We do a good enough job on our own by what we choose, right? But the adversary is there trying to shake us up a little bit. People are there. Religion's there. But let me just tell you, we don't have to spend time trying to figure out where the attacks are coming from. It doesn't really matter if God is shaking you up a bit to bring about righteousness and holiness in your life, it, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's that or if the adversary is on straight out attack after you. And the reason why it doesn't matter is because you handle them both the same. You seek God's face. You search after him. You get on your knees in prayer and he will get you through and he will bring about that stillness that we talked about. But we do know that there are those out there that are trying to cause us to be shaken and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3 says, That ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letters as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ, it's, we're closer today than we were yesterday. Our salvation is nearer, church. So let no man deceive you by any means. Don't allow that deception to creep into your life. And a lot of that's going to depend upon what your foundation you're building upon. So what foundation are you building upon? The sand that crumbles greatly and that house comes down or upon Jesus that he gets you through the storm. So our point of application is we should match his stability now because it's a reality of what we've already have. We already have it. It's ours. Why are we walking and living a life as if we don't have it? Godly fear is what's going to keep you there, okay? And the last part of this Okay, we know we're on a foundation of truth. But you also have to walk away from here understanding we know we're in a place of protection. Look at verse 29. This is a verse that puts a lot of fear in a lot of people. For our God is a consuming fire. He is a consuming fire. He's a God of love, but he's a God of light. He's a God of love and shows you the sacrifice because he gave up his own son, but he's a God of judgment. And that's what makes him holy. Because he is a just God, and he will show himself as a consuming fire. See, we, church, we don't have to worry about this. Because we don't have to worry about the wrath of God. See, God placed the, his wrath upon Jesus for those who place their faith and trust in him. But one day his wrath is coming back. And we get to come back with him during that time. We as the church get to come back with him when the great shakeup happens, right? 
Romans chapter 5 through 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved through the wrath through him. See, we're, there you go again, the blood. We're justified by it, just as if we've never sinned. His wrath is coming, and we don't have, we're in a place of protection. We, as a church, are protected by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 9 says this, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Jesus and the righteousness of God by faith. There you go. By faith is how we enter into a relationship. By faith is how we live out the matchful life of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, right? Who loved me and gave himself for me. It's his faith that we are to match, but we can't do it on our own. See, God's wrath is coming And it's going to consume everything that does not match his righteousness and his holiness. See, that's the message we need to be telling people. Jesus' righteousness is the only way a person could withstand God's wrath. So our point of application is this. We should match Christ's righteousness because it's what has made us fireproof. We are fireproof. But we should not take it for granted, as many do. We must choose to walk the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 19 says, Even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. Make a decision to walk in that righteousness. And the thing that's going to keep you there is that godly fear, that reverence and awe, right? So everyone, one day, one way or another, is going to experience this great shakeup. Those who come back with them. So again, prophetic calendar, when the second coming happens, guess what, church? You're coming back with him. The Old Testament saints are coming back with him. Those angels are coming back with him, and they're gonna, we're going to be with him and see this shakeup take place through his perspective. But then there's going to be those on earth that will believe, and they're going to see it from their perspective. But there's going to be others on earth that don't believe, and they're going to be like that cha- chase that's a, or that chap that's cast away. So we know what's coming, and this should motivate us to live, and this should motivate us to share. We know where we are. We're on a foundation of truth and on a foundation of protection. The fear of the Lord is designed to keep you on a proper path. If you're blinded by fear, then it's not his fear that you have because his fear gives clarity. God's chastisement is meant for our intimacy with him. He desires it to be close to us. But in order for that to happen, we must be like him through his righteousness. Godly fear and reverence will prepare us for what is to come. So I'm going to put that definition back up here, just so we can see it one more time, of Hebrews 12, 28. Again, when you lay it out in this, in this, um, in this definition, it says, to minister and to worship in a manner that is well-pleasing through a circumspect path of devotion. This is a life of godliness. This was the path of Jesus Christ. We need to live a life that matches Jesus and thought, spirit, and behavior. And I'm just going to, I have one more slide. I want you to go ahead and show it. I said this earlier, but this is really what I want you to capture out of all of this. That's going to propel us into everything we just talked about. Remember, a life of godliness prepares us for something greater and better than what we are currently experiencing. So church, what are you experiencing right now? What are you experiencing? Every day, get up, do the same thing over and over. Are you experiencing God's abundant, wonderful, mighty love in your life? Or right now, maybe there's some distance taking place. Some of you today do need to be shaken. Some of you today in this room does not know Jesus as their Savior. And I hope and pray that he puts his fear into you to show you That if you don't place your faith and trust in Jesus, you will be separated for all of eternity. And I hope that that shakes you to your core today. Maybe church, you guys, some of you are being shaken by something that's happened in life or something out of your control or maybe of your own decision. See, God uses those shakeups to remind us that we're still alive, to remind us he has more for us, that he has a desire to walk intimately with us. But we have to make that decision. 
And so I'm going to ask everybody to stand right now, please. And I'm going to pray. And I don't know what exactly is in your life and what God is doing. I hope he's shaking you a little bit. See, the great shaking is coming. It's going to happen. But where are you going to be sitting from? Are you going to be with him on the field? Are you going to be a fan out in the stand? Where are you going to be? But what will help you to be more like him when that day comes is the choices you make now to follow him in righteousness and holiness. So I'm going to pray, and after I pray, uh, we're going to have some music. You can even start it now. And we're going to just take a few minutes. You have the opportunity right now to come spend some time with God. Maybe he's wanting to work some things out in your life. Father, Lord, we humbly come before you. Thank you for shaking us, Lord. Thank you for how you approach the Old Testament saints, Lord, that, that uh, they saw you with fear. You gave them the Ten Commandments. You gave them the law. You use a man by the name of Moses to try to calm their fear, but to challenge them with what you were trying to accomplish. And what we come to now is a little bit different, but you're still coming to us. And there's so many people out there that need this message that we have the opportunity to be a part of a kingdom that is everlasting. And one day when you shake it, the only thing that's in that basket is what's going to last forever. So Father God, meet with us now. Continue to challenge us. Work in everybody's lives. Give them the opportunity right now to be able to do some business with you and uh, really seek your face, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let's take a few minutes.